Hey everybody, thanks for joining us on Facebook Live. I'm Allison Klein from Education Week, and joining me today is Noelle Ellerson Ng from AASA, the School Superintendents Association. So as many of you probably know, Congress just put a stop to new accountability rules that the Obama administration wrote for the Every Student Succeeds Act. And we're gonna be talking to Noelle today about what that means for school superintendents, the folks in AASA's membership. Um, so Noelle, um, obviously Congress struck these accountability rules, but what exactly does that mean? Did they get rid of ESSA, like the whole law, or just these rules? Absolutely, well first of all, thank you for the invitation to be here. I just got back from New Orleans, where AASA had its National Conference on Education, and ESSA and what's going on with ESSA and how ESSA implementation is going on is one of the big questions. And one of the things that was really helpful to the superintendents as we talked about this was, when you rescind the regulations under ESSA, it erases the Obama regulations. And then the, you know, the second clarification that was important is that that does not mean you revert to the regulations under No Child Left Behind. Oh, okay. So when you take yeah. away the ESSA regulations and you don't have the No Child Left Behind regulations, it means that the superintendents and their state holder groups that they're meeting with at the state level just write to the statute, which was bipartisan and strongly, strongly endorsed. So, but the law, the Every Student Succeeds Act, is still in place, is what the sounds like what you're telling me. It doesn't, this doesn't change that, yeah. The Congressional Review Act is a separate piece of legislation, but it does not impact the underlying statute. It rescinds the regulations that interpreted or made clarifications about the statute. And by Congressional Review Act, you're talking about the law that Congress used to rescind these rules mm -hmm. that we were just talking about. Correct. Okay, so that was some wonky, wonky um, there information know. there, but mm -hmm. just so everybody knows, ESSA is still in place. Mm -hmm. So some civil rights groups um, weren't in favor of getting rid of these rules. They worry that it could make it a lot harder for states to figure out their plans for ESSA accountability and get rid of some important protections for subgroups. I know you heard that argument quite mm -hmm. a bit. ASA was actually one of just a few groups who were out there saying, this is okay, Congress, you can go ahead and scrap these rules. And I'm wondering what the rationale was there. Absolutely. Well, I think the concerns and the priorities of the civil rights group are important to be noted in this conversation. Ensuring that we have continued equitable access to education opportunity for all of our students is important. When we look at the Congressional Review Act, though, and what it does in terms of truly empowering state and local education leaders to exercise the flexibility and authority intended to them in the underlying statute, this just makes clear that the intent of Congress is what they'll be exercising. And another thing that's important to note on this question is that this rescission of the regulations does not mean that states have to completely change direction on what they were doing. States and the stakeholder groups that they've convened are completely welcome to continue to move in the direction that they were working. The efforts that these states and local education leaders have undertaken are not lighthearted. They didn't accidentally happen overnight. It's been a year or so in the making. And this might represent an opportunity for them to make bigger changes because there's that lessened level of federal prescription. But there's definitely room for them to continue as they were doing, which is exactly what the secretary indicated in her letter on her first day after being confirmed, that it was full steam ahead for us implementation. So that's, that actually leads really well into my next question. So there's this big step, getting rid of these rules. But if states can keep doing what they were doing, does anything really change for the district leaders that make up your membership? Yes, actually it does. And this okay. is another line of interesting question, questioning at the conversation because while for the, the main part the collaboration between the state and local level has been highly collaborative, there are some areas where what le local education leaders want will differ from what the state is indicating or prioritizing or advancing. And what the rescission of the regulations does is it clarifies for the superintendents that they are writing to the statute. And when they are having conversations at the state level about a policy proposal that they may not be interested in, they've been coming to us a lot to say, what does the law require? And so okay. we can provide the statute. And even if it doesn't change the conversation, what it is allowing them to do is see that it is the state making the decision to stay the course, rather than necessarily being able to say, well, it's the feds that made us do it. Can you give me an example? all the time that happened when somebody came with you came yeah. with you to a question and you were like okay that's that's the feds that's the state mm -hmm. sorting all that out yeah so I got one and this was particularly relevant before the regulations were rescinded but a couple of states were looking at single summative indicator and they wanted to know is this what the law single is? just oh, for our people on Facebook live indicator. just break down quickly a single summative indicator is sort of an overall rating right for a school <laughs> okay so go ahead so this is a carryover from the no child yeah. Left behind line it, it's well intended. It's the idea that uh, the average community member, a parent, can get a quick sense of where that school is performing. Just like a child's report card can tell you they have an, a B in math, 
Well, that might mean that they're super strong on multiplication, but they struggle on word problems mm -hmm. and are less adept at algorithms. But overall, they're a B. And that's what a single summative score is. It's a single score on the overall school performance. And one significant change between NCLB and SAB, bet between No Child Left Behind and the new reauthorization, is that there wasn't an absolute requirement of single summative indicator. The state and locals can choose to continue that if they mm -hmm. find that helpful, but it wasn't a requirement. And when you looked at what the regulations initially were drafted as, there was some confusion as to whether or not the regulations were actually going to require a single summative indicator. And the final regulations actually made it a little more clear that the regulations were not requiring a single summative indicator. But this was the type of work that our superintendents were very interested in. They were familiar with the idea that the law was not requiring a single summative indicator. They could choose to do that, but okay. they didn't have to. And that's one of those questions we were getting. So some of your members basically were wondering whether um, their state had to have had to give an mm -hmm. overall grade to schools and you were making clear that that's really a state decision that mm -hmm. wasn't necessarily mm -hmm. in the regulations that that completely makes sense yeah. so what else are you hearing I know you just had this big conference in New Orleans you said ESSA was a hot topic mm -hmm. besides um, this change to the regs this getting rid of the old accountability regs what are some of the other things that your members want to know when it comes to when it comes to ESSA when it comes to ESSA, so they're really interested in funding with ESSA, and while yeah. that's, that's an appropriations conversation, which is the type of federal law that provides money, ESSA is what we call authorizing law, which allows a program to exist. It just, it's just okay. like a permission yeah. slip for a field trip. And <laughs> but the, the two go hand in hand, and so yeah. they're really interested in what the funding allocation will look like for Title I. Mm -hmm. uh, they're also particularly interested in what the funding will look like for Title IV, which is that really robust overhauled program that will provide support for things like well-rounded education, education technology, professional development, and school climate. And there's a really, really robust opportunity based on what Congress authorized, and the superintendents are really interested in seeing if Congress will step up and actually support the program that they created. Yeah, that's that big new program that can be used for almost anything, right? Mm -hmm. Like school safety, health, um, arts education. See, they, they're really curious Correct. about funding, it sounds like. So speaking of funding, I know you recently met with Betsy DeVos, the mm -hmm. new Secretary of Education. How did that conversation go? Do you guys see room for common ground between superintendents um, and the new department? So as an education geek, it was super cool to sit down and talk with the Secretary of Education, I'm not going to lie. As an, <laughs> as an education advocate who represents public school superintendents, I also won't lie that we have some concerns about what we can expect and how, how strong and consistent the support for public education will be. But we welcome the opportunity to sit down at the table, and we will be there every step of the way. Uh, her and her team were very open to us being there and having a conversation. And I don't think we will get along much on school choice conversation, but we'll be interested. We'll be looking at the budget proposal next week and the voucher proposals and where they are. Okay. Um, and I'm wondering if you can talk a little bit about school choice. I know that's one area that I would see a big difference, right, between mm -hmm. your organization and where the Trump administration wants to go. They've talked about vouchers. I'm wondering how you guys feel about that. Mm -hmm. But then also this idea of a federal tax credit scholarship where people get a break on their taxes for granting to um, scholarship organizations within states, which doesn't exactly take away money from education, mm -hmm. but maybe I you feel differently. Right. Anyway, yeah. do you want to, yeah, do you want to talk about that? I sure do. So we do a lot of our work on the voucher school choice privatization push through a coalition called the National Coalition for Public Education. Okay. And that's a broad group, really, really robust set of information about exactly what vouchers are and vouchers aren't and how the push for privatization, whether you're talking about a tuition tax credit or an education savings account, what that means and how that does or does not actually serve the students it states to serve. I want to believe wholeheartedly that when we have these school choice conversations and this broader push towards privatization that everyone is in this for the students and for the children and to the extent that that is the focus I just hope that we can let the facts speak and not get caught up in rhetoric and politics. When it comes to privatization and vouchers and tuition tax credits uh, ASA is opposed to vouchers, uh, but that's not a helpful position when everybody needs to be able to be heard. So when it comes to a broader public choice or school choice or parent choice AASA supports the um, conversation around choice, so so much that or such that every student has a choice and every parent has a choice. So we want to look at every policy proposal. How does your suggestion impact the child who doesn't get the treatment mm, more succinctly? Okay. How does your proposal provide educational opportunity for the child that leaves behind in the right. now further under-resourced class classroom? And when we look at tuition tax credits. 
when we look at the broader conversation about wanting to reduce the size of government, that mm -hmm. doesn't really sit well to reduce the size of government but create a new tuition tax credit program to fund yeah, vouchers. I hear that. I'd argue that Congress should Congress and the President and the Secretary should focus on the core initial commitments to K-12 education, which include Title I of ESSA and IDEA, and will be engaged very aggressively. Any dollar put towards vouchers or school choice, any dollar that's received towards a tuition tax credit is a deliberate decision to not invest in Title I and IDEA, and we will yeah. be there wholeheartedly to understand perhaps why they're prioritizing that, particularly when you look at how much underfunding of Title I will cut the legs out of the strongly but reauthorized ESSA. Yeah, and, and Title IDEA. I. Mm -hmm. it, and Title Title I, by Title I and special education, we're talking about kind of the two main federal mm -hmm. education programs. Um, well, Noel, thank you so much for yeah. your time. It was really great to talk to you. Great to be here. All thank right, you thank very you. Much.